Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 23 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Yes, welcome, everyone. Uh, good to have you here, and uh, hopefully hopefully your Ramadan is going well, and you are past that initial hurdle of getting used to uh, these long summer days. Uh, and hopefully you enjoyed our double treat, from last month, uh, which was to have two back-to-back episodes. That was a first for us, Zaki. And, and it's our gift to our audience. That's right. An early, an early Eid gift. There, there you go. That's pre, right. Pre-Eid. Pre-Eid. Yeah, Pre-Eid gift. And to continue with that pre-Eid gift tradition, we've got a little bit of a gift for you, a double, a double feature today of sorts as well, because we actually have two guests on. It's true. Well, and, and worth pointing out while, while we're talking about gifts, a couple of years ago, I got a little gift, which is I, I got to cross something off my personal bucket list, which was uh, my, one of my goals in life was to have my name mentioned in a satirical news article. Okay. And uh, it was my hope that one day I would, I would be, you know, uh, thought highly enough of one day to, to be mentioned uh, in, in a satirical form. And, and that happened thanks to our guests and talking about uh, Mirza Beg and Azhar Ahmed, who are the, the two of the three uh, brain children behind Islamica, the satirical news site, which started in 1999. And uh, Azhar and, and uh, Mirza, thank you for joining us. Salam, guys. Ramadan Mubarak. Glad to be on. Um, before I begin, uh, Zaki, what, uh, where where'd you guys get the intro music to Diffuse Congruence? Well, uh, Pervez? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we actually, this is an old family friend. Uh, he, it, you know, just kind of twiddles around with the guitar on the side. Um, and uh, actually, well, Mirza, you would know Asad. You remember Asad from Houston? I do. Yeah. So he's a, he's a, he's a dentist by day, a, a, a raging guitarist by night. Uh, no, actually, he doesn't. But uh, he was kind enough to pick up the guitar after actually many years, uh, uh, Azur, and, uh, uh, and, and record the intro and outro music that you hear. Uh, and someone Mirza knows as well, um, and, uh, old family friend of all of ours, um, and including Zucky's uh, in-laws and mine and, uh, and, and Mirza's as well. I think when you guys evolve into video, you guys have to have a fog machine and both of you guys walking out of a spaceship <laughs> converging. And that's when you see this lightning bolt and then diffuse congruence. I, yeah. I think that's, that's the, we, we do that anyway, but without benefit of, of people seeing it, we just do it for our own amusement. <laughs> that's right. We've got the fog machine and everything. Yeah. So, so guys, so, so I feel like, uh, you know, this has been kind of the last couple of years, certainly, certainly the last year has been uh, seen a rise in Islamophobia and really a lot of anti-Muslim rhetoric. And, and it's out there and it's it's depressing. And obviously there's a lot of stuff to talk about. But I have said that the the, the one well, there there are a few positives, but I think one positive in the amount of of idiotic Islamophobia out there is that it gives you guys this wellspring of content. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we took a little bit of a hiatus there for a couple of years. Um, and I think we needed to kind of, you know, take care of life. But uh, I think the creative process never really stopped with us. I think we always had this backlog of, of thoughts and ideas. And I think you hit the nail on the head as I think uh, things kind of came together and uh, insanity got cranked up a notch. And <laughs> I, re- I remember I was sitting there and we were we were talking about it and we're like, oh, well, you know, we got to get back to writing. We got to get the site up and we got to start uh, start fresh with a couple of things. So I know that uh, I think one of the first articles that we wrote when we came back was about, um, you know, it wasn't actually Islamophobia, but I think it was about Al Qaeda uh uh, hiring their first chief marketing officer, uh, just to remember the fact that their their recruitment numbers were probably down. Um, but it was interesting. I mean, it was just just getting back into the writing mode. I think was therapeutic for me because there were so many things that I think we wanted to say and satirize and and uh, get back to writing about. But I think finally web publishing caught up to the point where it's really been a lot more liberating for us and, and enjoyable. I'd say, uh, mm-hmm. if I dare speak on your behalf here, Marza, to just be able to publish without necessarily. An 
could issue uh, sort of a schedule, uh, which actually has resulted in us writing probably more than we ever have in the past. Well, uh, I mean, let's let's go back in time a little bit. Now, now you started in '99, and I mean, this is pre-9/11, and the the rhetoric. Well, there's always been sort of heated rhetoric uh, in the media about Islam and whatnot. It certainly wasn't uh, to the degree that that it is now. Uh, so, what what was the impetus behind that? What was what was the landscape where you said, "Hey, you know, this is something we should we should do." And 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 while and while you answer that, guys, um, you know, it, it refresh my memory, if you will, because you know that's that period of time that I remember uh, pretty vividly in terms of attending ISNA conferences and seeing you guys always having a presence. And in fact, I think the first time I ever came across Islamica was the T-shirts that you guys used to sell in the bazaar. Now, is that was that tied in with the sort of genesis of of Islamica? Is that where it begins, or does this sort of begin as this sort of satirical? Uh, you know, magazine, if you will. Actually, it, it predates all of that, right? I mean, a lot of um, we're seeing, you know, post 9/11 is a lot of, you know, notable person and personalities from uh, the American Muslim world. We're seeing, you know, a lot of um, uh, prominent uh, people coming out and talking about Islam, Islamic relations uh, in America in so many different capacities. And you know, to your point, we started in '99, very pre 9/11. But I would say our material probably predates any of that as well, right? I think. Uh, and collectively, we're all kids of, uh, of immigrants, right? Immigrants from Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, from wherever. And I think as soon as our parents stepped foot in America, that's when the material really started, right? It's really the, uh, the, the relationship between uh, that experience, um, that immigration experience in the United States, and adapting to uh, uh, American lifestyle, right? And so we draw a lot of material from that. And so you make mention of us pre 9-11. I think a lot of our, um, uh, a lot of our material just comes from our parents uh, trying to live the day to day, establishing Islamic centers across uh, America. Uh, and, and through that process comes a lot of, um, a, a lot of great stories of accomplishment, but also the, uh, through that process, we see a lot of comedy being generated. And I think that, has a lot to do with Islamica and the reasons why we came together. Um, you know, like you said, we started actually um, as a, you know, out of a need, uh, uh, out of a demand that we saw from young American Muslims uh, where uh, they were in search of identity, really. Um, and, and this was in the context of, uh, you know, where, where there were options of alternate uh, sort of Muslim vendors selling shirts, but those shirts were very objective. They weren't cool to wear. You know, some of the shirts even said, you know, um, uh, uh, believe in Islam or you're potentially going to hell. Right. So we needed to provide some sort of cool alternative to the Muslim youth living in America as a way that they could every morning walk to their closet and really be given an option of uh, a, a cool sort of uh, alternative that that would really reflect um uh, their Muslim lifestyle and their Muslim identity. And this was pre-Twitter, right? I mean, if you think about T-shirts in the past, uh, T-shirts were essentially the, the Twitter of, uh, of the, the, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, wherever, right? And so that's why we thought uh, uh, T-shirts as a, as a way to really kind of invoke conversation uh, and also be representative of, of Muslim identity. I don't know. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think uh, you know, what was interesting for me is I, I actually grew up in uh, in predominantly a non-Muslim sort of an environment. You know, we were immigrants as well, and uh, I grew up on the north side of Chicago. It was a Puerto Rican neighborhood, and uh, even though we moved out to the suburbs, I never really had many Muslim friends um, up until I got to college, uh, which was the interesting thing to go through the MSA experience as somebody who was still kind of a bit of an outsider to Muslim culture. So it was just, it was shocking to me to have gone through that and say, well, wow, you know, there are a lot of people that have gone through very similar things. Um, and my warped imagination was shared by my compatriot here. Uh, <laughs> we, we immediately bonded on that. And I think, honestly, Islamica was just a natural extension of an MSA that didn't want to stop meeting. You know, we needed an excuse to hang out. Uh, and, and Islamica was it. So, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it started as an expression that was in apparel and T-shirts. And, and we really felt like, you know, a lot of things, 
at the time. And I, I would still say to a certain degree today, people take things very seriously, which they should when it comes to matters of, of religion. I think people are very passionate about that. But, you know, our whole approach has always been just, you know, about as laid back as we are, you know, just just right. smile, you know, as crack a joke. Uh, if you can laugh together, then, then the world can't be that bad. So that's really been the principle behind everything we do. And, and in the years since, you know, whether it was apparel, which we hope to do again in the very near future, bring that back. Uh, whether it's live entertainment that we've done. We've done some uh, arguably uh, sophomoric film, which I know, Zaki, you were featured in, in one of those. Uh, I, I was, yeah. <laughs> you know, those, are, those are all naturally, I think, part of the same thread for us, which is just trying to get people to, to enjoy things and, and not take uh, things so seriously and hopefully find some commonality. I, I don't want to gloss over anything, so I, I want to pick up on that sophomoric film in just a little bit. But um, I, I do want to go back to so much – I mean, first of all, so much of what Mirza said, so much of what you said, Azhar, uh, just resonates because, I, again, you know, again, as an outsider, right, I mean just uh, – or as a consumer, I should say, of, of your material from the very outset uh, as an attendee at these large conferences – uh, you know, you guys struck such a or created such a buzz because of some of the points I think that Mirza made in terms of, you know, just lacking the, or the, the, the lack of uh, finding, quote unquote, cool apparel that, you know, uh, was an was an outreach of your identity, uh, but at the same time wasn't taking it too seriously, uh, because prior to that, you had these very, again, as, as uh, I think Mirza mentioned, like very somber msa t-shirts that was it that was all we had right and and so to have like a shirt you know, or see to see people walking around isna with a shirt that said god will do question mark like that was that was funny right and and that was i think like i remember that initial buzz and it it, it was it was great from a marketing point of view bringing people to your booth uh i think uh for that for this for that initial run Oz, uh, you want to share the the story of the first isna <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Which is of... when? Please, yeah, because I, I was a so I was an avid Isna goer, 1993 all the way to 2005. So there's like a period of like 10 to 12 years where I didn't miss a single Isna. So you, I think that this is our, our, certainly our Isna journeys overlap. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the year, if I'm placing it correctly, was right around 1999, maybe even the year before, I, I think, because we, we officially established then. But um, I mean, I, I remember it was we, we thought, all right, well, you know, we, we want to do this. And, and we had a, a couple of ideas that we thought would make uh, interesting designs. Uh, okay. One. One is simple that just said Salam, which has been one of our classics. Uh, another one that said Dat Wadu, and a third one that just basically had uh, the words pig written and crossed out, and it basically said, uh, it was just talking about basic, I think it was pork is haram, dancing is haram, dancing pigs are really haram, just kind of playing off of <laughs> Um, building ideas, yeah. So anyway, uh, we, we, we printed up a handful of shirts that were expensive to us as college kids, but, um, you know, we thought we actually struck a deal with uh, Islam, where at the time was one of the more serious companies, and we thought we had an agreement to basically be able to sell off of one little micro uh, corner of their booth, but unfortunately they didn't have any room for us. So I remember it was Mirza and I uh, literally kicked uh, next door to the, 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 the convention that year was in Chicago, uh, and we were uh, kicked over to the hotel next door, and uh, we literally grabbed these shirts and, and slung them over our shoulders and uh, walked through the convention hall. Uh, we were actually trying to sell at the hotel next door, but obviously traffic was much less than in the main bazaar area. So we kind of got, um, you know, pardon my friends, we got a little pissed off because we, we got a little bit shafted there in terms of not having a, a place to sell our stuff. So uh, we grabbed the shirts and started walking up and down the bazaar, uh, much to Isna's, uh, you know, uh, anger, uh, they, they huh. stopped us from doing that. But, uh, we, we pretty much, uh, uh, sold pretty everything, I think, off of our backs that in that one, one night, I think we, uh, I don't remember how many shirts we even had, Mirza, but there were, there were quite a few of them. I think uh, we walked in with like 150 and literally like within like three, four hours, we sold out, which was insane, right? Because, it was something that we were not expecting to walk into. And I think the reaction that we got as we were kind of migrating, if you will, from that, you know, hotel to over to the main center was just, you know, unexpected. And we were floored by the reaction. And honestly, that was probably um, the, uh, the event that really motivated for the, for, uh, for the, for the subsequent years. And, and just to kind of give it uh, some more context, 
this what this concept uh, to your point Bruce, was very new and i and i don't want to say innovative because i know what that word what sort of reaction that word can trigger but um we were basically coming in into a market that wasn't used to associating muslim humor or sorry humor with with anything islamic or anything muslim and so through this process we had to endure a lot of criticism as well right uh, a lot of uh, what we um, put on shirt or what we wrote in the articles would be lost in translation so we would uh, get a lot of negative feedback saying oh you guys are making fun of islam or how can you guys be doing this um, and so when i look at the um, efforts that you know a lot of organizations a lot of uh, 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 groups do today in terms of uh, publishing a lot of content media doing a lot of jokes and stuff they don't have to endure nearly um the sort of uh repercussions and the backlash that we had to go through uh and we really had to kind of um uh, set those expectations and really kind of uh raise the bar along the way but you know it it has been i guess an exercise in patience and you know obviously an exercise in endurance doing yeah, here, here's an interesting little bit uh to if one year uh, i think it was mirza's idea for the design so i'll i'll put the blame on him we actually had a fatwa <laughs> against us um <laughs> at isma wow. uh, it was uh somebody brought in one of the shirts we were selling which the front of it read do you think i'm hot uh, and the back of it read so is hell lower your gaze um and uh, i think <laughs> Somebody saw just the front of the shirt and asked the imam if these shirts were halal, uh, and he literally he basically declared them haram. Only to backtrack about five minutes later, when somebody uh, whispered over to him that there was a back to the shirt, uh, and it did say so as hell lower your gaze. So I think you know there were there were a lot of interesting little uh, anecdotes like that. <laughs> uh, so we we were we were we were literally declared unlawful for a, a brief moment there. Not before we had to go in the hiding for for a little. While. <laughs> that, that is epic that is epic uh and, and so sort of demonstrative of the fact that i mean it's, it's things that we've touched on in the past in the show with other artists that you know um yeah i mean the reaction from quote unquote the establishment if you will is oftentimes you know the same which is you know rejection or you know in this case issuing a fatwa <laughs> so yeah um so now now i guess transition if you will from uh the apparel into uh an online presence if i if i re- well or, or does that does, does that come first or is it the uh the quote unquote sophomoric mov- uh, movie well you know actually uh i would say that probably the the thread to follow there is you know we 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 love doing shirts but right. i think we ran out of space <laughs> on apparel uh to write down what we wanted to write down so <laughs> <laughs> good one yeah so i think at the time we decided all right well let's let's write uh and i think we had islamic news as a print publication uh initially i mean the first couple of issues uh weren't on the web they were just kind of printed and handed out um at the convention so i i think we for a couple of years there we wanted to go in with an issue an isma issue right um, year so that's i think the first five issues we had were kind of print editions and i think in parallel with that that's when some of the movie ideas uh, sort of film ideas came about uh including uh the Blair Khan project which <laughs> where is it talk about yeah, Please, yeah, yeah. Because, give us the heads up on the Blair Khan project which i, I love this i yeah. i share a little bit of skin in this game that's right uh in fact i and i i remember vividly watching it after i think it was friday night prime time or saturday night prime time isna that was the featured entertainment and it was brilliant i have to say so yeah, yeah take us through that not not to mention the fact that my like my cousin happens to be uh you know spoiler blair khan so <laughs> i i think you know the in 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 developing um you know islamic based content one thing that we've always tried to do was um you know remain relevant and you can kind of see that through the islamic islamic news some of the articles where we kind of point fun of of things that are going on uh you know with current affairs and the current news and it it began very well with that first installation of that movie right so back um in the late 90s uh there was the movie that came out the low budget uh flick that came out uh look the blair witch project And so as big fans of just that entire uh initiative, right? That entire project that was under budget, it was kind of a subcultural sort of things. Uh we started talking about, you know, how can we draw from the success 
of the Blair Witch Project and come up with something on our own, but at the same time uh, push, you know, maybe a learning lesson or at least tie some sort of um, takeaway from it. And that's how we came up on uh, uh, the, the, Blair, 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 the Blair Khan Project. And so we did that in collaboration with, you know, other people from Chicago, um, Zaki, people that you know well, um, uh, Rehan Siddiqui, Tahami Siddiqui, uh, Omar Sultan. And, and we kind of joined forces to come up with this parody, if you will, that literally lampooned each one of those scenes that you see uh, in, in the Blair Witch Project. So it, the, 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 the storyline basically is, is of an uh, uh, a Indian uh, movie uh, production group, an amateur movie production group, who sets out to essentially – um, take on one of their projects, but then gets lost along the way in trying to find this legend of the Blair Khan. Um, and so uh, as they start down, they start going uh, through, you know, different uh, towns. They come across Islamophobia. Yes, Islamophobia was very well and alive back in the late 90s. Um, <laughs> and so they come across these little towns and they, they, they confront all this ignorance. And then ultimately they find this Blair Khan at the end, and I don't want to give away the, the, the ending, but, you know, 10, 15 years later, whatever, uh, <laughs> uh, basically they finally come across uh, this Blair Khan guy who uh, the whole time was just trying to get them uh, to, to come to the mosque. And, and so through that pro- process, through that soul searching, uh, there's, you know, what we thought at the time was, was um, you know, a lot of comedy. Uh, if you kind of look back at it now, the, you know, a lot of the, the comedy is, is very, um, I would say, timely. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of lost jokes and in in pop culture references. Uh, but, yes, it was uh, very well a success story just because it was so different. And the reaction that we got from that ISNA conference that we presented as entertainment, in fact, what we did was um, we had an Islamica booth every year. And so when we started playing it at the booth, it literally con- uh, created this, uh, uh, this issue of, 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 of blocking the, uh, the, 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 the hallways, Right. Uh, so the organizers came to us and said, you know what, you guys have to cancel. You have to get you guys have to stop playing this. We'll cut a deal with you. We'll play at main entertainment, but you have to agree that you've got to cease uh, playing this at your booth because it's creating too many logistical issues. Wow. And so that was how we got on the main screen at ISNA and very well enjoyed that that big audience. Uh, one being Pervez, of course, um, uh, at, at at Sunday Night Entertainment at the ISNA conference. Yeah, you, it was know, you know, one person who hasn't seen it is me. I've actually never seen uh, the Blair Khan project. Oh my uh, god, you have it on YouTube, right? Yeah, I think we put it up on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, oh, in that case, well, then it's on me for for now. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't promoted it. You know, it's one of those things where I think for a while there we actually had a good run of different videos that we did, including Blair Khan. But yeah, I mean, I think video was just such a powerful media for us, and then you know to to put it on a 19 inch rinky dink screen on a booth in a bazaar uh, and have the crowds just kind of swarm in the way they did was just like, oh my god, you know, we're I think we're onto something. And uh, you know, our challenge has always been that you know given that we we didn't uh, invest in the sort of professional grade equipment. I think Blair Khan was a coalescence of you know things that that worked well for us. Like Mirza said, the the fact that it was low budget, the fact that we could be fairly authentic, and that we had such a good crew that came together. A lot of different people from the area that were really talented uh, contributed to it, and I think it was uh, it'll it'll stand. I think uh, in our history as one of the things that I think I'm most proud of. Awesome. Um, well, I, I, I hope you guys uh, get some uh, traffic uh, to the to, to the movie. Uh, is, any plans to sort of make all of the films that you guys have done available through the website? Yeah, you know, I think that's it's probably on me to not uh, to be the bottleneck there, but I think we've got a, a ton of video content. Right. We we actually did back when when uh, uh, not to let too much of the cat out of the bag, but I think we one of the the ones that I wish we actually edited and got out there was, if you guys remember back in the 90s, uh, there was, uh, I think Robert Urick used to host When Animals Attack. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was, uh, uh-huh. yeah. So we did uh, we did uh, When Hafiz's Attack, uh, <laughs> our version of that with Arabic teachers, basically, but uh, had some really great footage in there, but never actually strung it together. So we've got a ton of B-roll that I think uh, we want to definitely get out there, um, as well as I think we started to even dabble with some versions of Islamica News Live uh, that I think we'd want to do as well. But yeah, tons of ideas um, and hopefully a little more time to be able to do these things in the coming months. 
So now you, so so you had you had kind of a run in the late '90s, early 2000s, and then as you said, you kind of, you went on hiatus. Yeah. Well, well, actually, before the hiatus, though, because again, as um, you know, as someone who again was a consumer of your online content, um, you know, the, uh, the the Islamic web right really takes off, and I mean, uh, I, I would say again in the late '90s, early 2000s, certainly, I remember in the in the days and weeks and months following 9/11, you know, having sort of that online, uh, what would you call it, like this sort of online, uh, like a bulletin board. Yeah, bulletin boards and conversations to be able to interact with other people, uh, which is one of the, one of the things that the Islamic Web forums provided, uh, and I think was just brilliant. And it was it was social media before there was social media in terms of, you know, really being able to to to, to just engage in conversations with people from all over the world, really, because I mean there was people from Europe and and really all over, um, and just talking about issues of, I mean there was. You know, I remember the forums had, you know, light and humor, humorous stuff, but there was also like serious discussions on Islam and, you know, and post 9-11 and Islamic law and all these wonderful things. So uh, it was it was it was a great it was a great resource. So, I, you know, I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about that as well before sort of the hiatus. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, pre Facebook, you know, I think yeah. we had a pretty good run there, I think. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, it, you know, it, it was very much in the same spirit of everything we do. I think much like other communities that were out there that were either very religiously and knowledge focused or uh, were, you know, maybe a little too crazy. We tried to ride that line of what we believe our editorial. Hold on just one second. <laughs> our, our editorial standard to be. Um, but, you know, our whole uh, law around that was like it or leave it. You know, we pretty much left most things unmoderated there. And, and I think the community was thankfully people that were very much of the same spirit. So, you know, I'd love to take more credit for it than, than, than uh, we probably should. But, you know, it was it was the people that made the community. Um, and I think just being that lightning rod of conversation and having Islamic news, uh, you know, which we had transitioned onto the web at that time, really helped to kind of sustain this sort of traffic and, and people coming in and, and finding like-minded, uh, you know, borderline uh, insane Muslims to hang out with. So, so th- this was this was what period of time when when the the forums were really uh, yeah. Off? I, I think the forums uh, were probably from like about two thousand. I'm sorry, hold on, just one second. <laughs> I got a two year old here. Hey, it's Father's Day. It's okay. So uh, yeah. we're, we're recording today, guys. Uh, for those, yeah, for our listeners uh, on Father's Day. So that, right. that just uh, yeah. So uh, that run was from about I want to say from about 2000 to right about 2005. I want to say, yes. and then you know, then social media kind of kicked in, and everybody had a Facebook profile. <laughs> Uh, right. that's, uh, okay. and, you know, it's funny, like, you know, I, I even forget that we still have a forum that's up there. There's still a few <laughs> random people in private areas. Uh, God knows who they are uh, still kicking around over there. Wow. But, uh, you so know, I, I, yeah. And no, I, I, I remember vividly. Yeah. It, it certainly from for me, at least from 2000 to 2003, uh, that was my go to like that was like my you know, home page. You know, when I opened the when I opened my browser, so uh, uh, totally guilty of being one of those guys. And uh, in fact, I remember Isna maybe two thousand three, maybe two thousand four. Uh, a lot of us actually had a little mini reunion at Isna, uh, uh, meaning in, in terms of like all these different people who were just conversing online, had never right. met in person, and to then finally put a face to the person you either, you know, in some cases like myself, like. I'd, I'd get into some pretty heated conversations or heated debates with with, with some of with, with some of the folks on there, and then to meet that person face to face, and it's like, oh, it's, you know, cute little cuddly bear, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it just it, it was great, and it it, it it was also you know talk about timely, you know, like now with the anonymity of Twitter and Facebook and what have you, uh, certainly Twitter, uh, you know, people can hail in the comments section of any article. You know, you hail all this vitriol against someone because you have that 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 anonymity. So um, that was kind of a lesson learned early on in terms of the early days of the internet about how a lot of that can be, uh, yeah, a lot of that can be misgiving there. So. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you know it, it's a little strange for me, uh, having been the guy that was probably up there, and everybody knew me. I I, I didn't use a pseudonym or anything. I was other. So um, everybody. 
<laughs> everybody knew me, um, although I didn't necessarily track everybody's usernames to who they were, but it was interesting. I mean, I think from my perspective, the, the huge sort of life lesson for me was that we're not all that dissimilar. Yes. Uh, and life, life follows so many patterns, you know, like clockwork, um, you know, new people would come in with their fresh eyes and old people would, uh, uh, revolt against them <laughs> because this was their, their community, their site, uh, and yeah. new people are coming in that don't get it. So, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Is that having that human element and those meetups, which were largely organized by the community's members themselves, they were I, yeah. so great because it's like, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I may not, uh, I may argue with you all the time. But it's like, you know, you and I are pretty similar when we see each other face to face. So good times, um, good times. I, I feel like I missed out. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like uh, you, you guys did, had like you did. Sorry. Oh. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> uh, and like I said, I mean, I, I, again, I don't think I'm being uh, unique or alone in saying this, that a lot of my sort of development in terms of just being able to deal with what was happening in the world post 9-11 you know, just being able to talk with Muslims from around the world, literally, uh, you know, and, and engage with Muslims around the world was was just was was it was extremely positive and have you guys to thank for that. So, uh, yeah, that was that was great. Okay, I think, again, it, 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 fill, it filled a niche at a very critical time in Muslim discourse, especially among young people who were, again, you know, still dealing with not only the Internet and online content, but also what was happening, you know, post 9-11. Yeah, you know, I, I think I speak for Mirza here when I say, you know, we started this endeavor uh, largely and honestly selfishly uh, to amuse ourselves. You know, I think uh, we, we did this because we, we enjoyed uh, kind of entertaining each other and, and, and laughing. And, and I'm glad that uh, others have found value in it and have uh, flocked around it and created their own pockets. And I think that's really one of the things that, you know, I'm really kicking myself over because we had our little bit of a hiatus there. Uh, to primarily to get married and, and, and establish careers uh, outside of, of Islamica. But um, I think uh, coming back on the other side of that, it's definitely one of those where, you know, we, we, uh, we, we relaunched last April, uh, and in the last year, the support has been nothing short of overwhelming. <laughs> so, uh, definitely feel like it's something that, that is a calling that, that we definitely need to continue and, and continue to embrace. Okay, well, well, let's. I mean, that's that's a good good way to pivot. Uh, so, so you you mentioned why you uh, went on hiatus. Talk about what what ultimately prompted you. I mean, you know, it's very easy. I mean, especially in the internet with a lot of web ventures. Uh, what I've found is that uh, once you stop doing it, the reasons to come back and keep doing it become less and less significant. You know, the, the the Internet is littered with sort of abandoned blogs and, and Twitter accounts and whatnot, you know. Uh, so what was the thing that lit a fire under you that said, you know what, we got to we got to we got to start doing this again? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, just kind of uh, looking back, you know, in 2005, I had a conversation with a, a college student and I was talking about. Uh, Islamica, and I mentioned, you know, um, well, we have a company called Islamica. We do this, these shirts. We do, you know, we publish this news online. And immediately that person was like, oh, yeah, I heard of you guys. In fact, you know, one of my friends bought your shirts, and I read this one article that you guys wrote, uh, and it was hilarious. And, you know, we got all this great feedback. And then fast forward, you know, 2010, 2011, had the same conversation with a different college student. And started talking about Islamica, and, you know, all I got was, like, blank stares. They had never heard of Islamica. And uh -huh. it was probably at that point, I know Azra has very similar experiences, it was probably at that point where we were like, what the hell just happened, right? First, we hmm. were, like, this top-of-mind sort of uh, great content generator, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 an organization that really enjoyed pushing out content, getting feedback on that content, and, and really, at the end of the day, really enjoyed entertaining its audience. Uh, and now we've potentially become irrelevant. Um, and how, how is that? Especially when the entire internet is generating all this amazing content. Um, you know, how can we be, uh, you know, not, not in that sort of, uh, uh spectrum of, of visibility. And so, uh, it was probably at that point where, uh, at least from my perspective, we knew we had to get back in because, you know, honestly, I think Azra alluded to this before, you know, him and I use each other as, as, as essentially filters to determine what's good content and what might, you know, kind of need to be shelved or not see the light of day. 
Um, and through that filter process, we know that, you know, at least ourselves between us two, we, we really like our content. We laugh at our content. If we're the only two doing it, so be it. That's, that's what it is. Um, and so we knew we had good content to share just by the virtue of talking about it. Why not throw up, throw, throw this content back on, uh, online and, and regenerate, uh, you know, some, of, some of the buzz that we once had. Um, and so that's essentially what happened, uh, late last year. In fact, the conversations extend, you know, prior to that. Uh, but we really knew that we had, you know, a lot of amazing content that never saw the light of day that was, you know, on the, the cutting room floor. And how would we be able to repurpose this and reintroduce ourselves, uh, into the mix, utilizing a lot of the stuff that, you know, that, that really never made it. So for example, when Hofstra's attack, Another one was a parody of the real world. Um, and then we've had so many different, you know, sort of stints at content that we, you know, internally laugh at that, that, you know, the rest of the world hasn't seen. And so with that vault of information and content, we decided to come back. Um, and that was basically the, the calling that we needed. The, the kicking. Yeah, you know, and, uh, you know, just to add on to that, I'd say from, from my perspective, and I think Mirza's as well, is that, you know, given that we were kind of early on and we had a ton of backlash to a lot of what we did, you know, you had to develop pretty thick skin uh, to just keep doing it. And I think not that I think that made us go on hiatus by any stretch, but I think that the world was a different place uh, about 10 years ago, even 15 years ago. Um, where people weren't willing to even share their real names online. And, you know, when you look at it now and you see how things have progressed and in some ways deteriorated, I think it's interesting for us to go back and revisit a lot of those ideas. You know, we were our, uh, our, we, we censored ourselves a lot back in the day. And I think now we're, we're continuing to push our boundaries and try to push our creative uh, sort of limits and, and reframe it in, in a modern context that I think has been, you know, again, incredibly liberating, liberating. I think we've had a lot of duds, <laughs> along the way with articles and ideas. Uh, but I think, you know, it's helping us get, get our fingers back on the pulse and see, you know, what are the things that resonate and ultimately uh, people find useful. So uh, you, you started back up uh, in April of 14, you said. And um, yeah, this is the, the, the story that I was mentioned in. I just wanted to do a little shameless self-promotion while I promote yourself. Um, you, you commented on the, the Mipsters movie, which it's funny because, you know, you're talking about how with the Blair Khan project, it was like these pop culture references that wouldn't mean anything now. I feel like the Mipsters thing is like a perfect example of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, with the Mipsters thing, you know, and this was us, you know, again, this was part of the reason I think we wanted to write again is that uh, there were things that were happening and we're like just thinking these in the thought bubbles above our head. You know, the Mipsters uh, video was probably released at least, I think, about a year before we wrote that article. But everybody had seen it because it's just this collage of of seeming randomness of cool Muslims on skateboards. Uh, oh, right. All of this, you know, it, it just some of it just seems so random. So I remember thinking, well, okay, well, this is an interesting trailer, but where are you guys going with it? Uh, so the thought was, yeah, if it was actually a full length film, it would probably be fairly nonsensical. Uh, at which point, you know, Zaki, you were obviously top of mind uh, with what you're doing. <laughs> partner of like okay well you know what if this was actually released and what would zucky say about it uh just you know the the just extending that sort of randomness into a 60 minute feature film and and uh, the 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 catastrophe that would be not you know and full disclaimer i'd love to see it <laughs> <laughs> well uh, according to your article i gave it a d so, so. <laughs> and, that, and that's that's pretty you know that's rough because i don't give very many movies d's but but there it is yeah yeah well when you have pancakes on people's heads uh, throughout most of the movie that's probably going to end up being the case <laughs> <laughs> well talk a little bit about your process now now uh, like how often do you update do you have a set like do you do you say we're going to drop new articles every x number of days or do you just kind of wait for for inspiration to strike like what what what's walk us through uh you know conception to to um you know completion yeah uh you know i don't know if you you probably have your own thoughts but i'd say it's less of a process and more of an alchemy you know it is a little bit of okay well you see something and you think you want to write something about it and I, we've had some of our most successful articles written within the course of you know from conception through writing you know within the course of four hours uh whereas others that you know i honestly felt were funnier end up going nowhere so uh, it is still a little bit of an experiment for us but it is interesting because i think traditionally we stuck to an issue-based 
based model where we were trying to build, you know, a collection of 12 to 15 articles uh, and infographics and everything else. Um, and that that became such a burden to maintain where I think once we pulled the lid off, uh, I think since we've done it, uh, since we've relaunched, I think we've written over 100 articles, which is quite a bit over the course of about a year. Yep, exactly. And I think we revisited the, the, the content structure of uh, how we publish, right? So um, before it was traditionally, you know, articles in long form, uh, as well as, um, you know, these info uh, infographs that, that others mentioned. Um, but in addition to that, what we decided to do when we revisited this whole process was really look at, you know, how people are consuming social media and, and just, you know, the different personalities that are comprised you know, in, in that in that world, and also come up with these uh, sort of parallel, fictitious sort of characters, uh, mm -hmm. where we can really utilize uh, channels like Twitter uh, and even ultimately Instagram, but also have these personalities, these fictitious personalities, live with their profile pages and everything, and then also kind of uh, publish these bite-sized sort of uh, quotes. Um, you know, thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. So, so one of the characters that we introduced as part of this process was Sheikh Khalid Mabudi, who's got yeah, the Twitter handle. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> at, at Sheikh Mabudi. And basically, <laughs> he is that quirky, awkward imam that resides in every other Islamic center that we've come to know and love, right? And so he is a patriot, but he, he is married, but at the same time, he's kind of single. Um, and he just has this, um, I guess, um, non-qualified understanding of Islam. And somehow, by default, he is the imam of his community. And so we've used his personality. We've given him, you know, so many different um, properties online. And then through that process, we talk about, you know, how he has essentially managed his community. And obviously, he's tweeting as well. And so, um, you know, from that from that personality, we, we, we've got a lot of humor. And that's a lot easier to publish because it's just, you know, brain fart of ideas on the behalf of Sheikh Mabudi. Yeah, and it's interesting. Sheikh Mabudi was actually, you know, visually at least, he was the inspiration. Uh, he was inspired from one Hafiz's attack. He was one of the Hafiz's that was training Arabic, and it just seemed like such a good character. Mirza has a handful of those that I'd love to bring <laughs> back out into video form. <laughs> Now, just looking at some of the stuff you've covered recently, I, I look at, um, for example, you were able to do something really funny with the, uh, you know, there was a, in, in uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm in, was it, was it in Texas? It's already in Arizona, in Arizona, the um, anti-Muslim rally that, that happened in Arizona a few weeks ago. Um, you, you guys uh, had, a, had a, a story where you said bike rally participants were blocked in the parking lot by mosque latecomers. That, that was a great opportunity for us to really um, be able to take that story and uh, twist it into something that was uh, positive but also just weird. Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, the morning of that protest, uh, Azar called me up and it was like, you know, what can we do with this? And, you know, you know we started bouncing ideas off. And, and literally within two hours, we had something written up we had it edited. We had, you know, a, a, a hero image uh, with it, and we had it published. Uh, and basically the story was that these protesters, you know, with their hate came to the mosque, you know, at Juma time. Um, and in that process, while they were protesting, all these congregants started coming up and did what they do, and that is they blocked each other in. And so part of blocking each other in was blocking these row of, of bicycles that belonged to this biker gang. And so... Stuck in that situation, they were forced to kind of interact with that community. And part of interacting was uh, buying the Friday biryani um, and also just, um, uh, you know, start, start, start yelling and being frustrated at, 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 the, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the car owner next to them. And so it became, you know, a humorous article. It caught a jet stream as part of that story and how that circulated. And that was probably one of our more popular article ideas. And one thing that we also added to that was uh, live uh, tweeting, live coverage of the event. So we pretended that we were basically on site. Oh, wow. Different personalities. We started covering the story as it unfolded. And so that became, you know, um, a point of engagement as well. Just all these kind of uh, weird, quirky things that happened uh, along the way and just, you know, kind of um, using our observation by not yeah, being there. 
Yeah, that's actually, you know, we, we've, we've had, uh, we've been on Twitter at Islamica News for a while and we thought, you know, this is the perfect opportunity to live tweet for the first time. Uh, and it's amazing, you know, in that time, I think it actually really lit up our Twitter activity to be able to, uh, have random little tweets and nuggets of things that some of which we would probably never publish on the web, but, uh, make for interesting tweets, uh, just as observations as we're seeing things unfold, at least in our minds, uh, as, as they're happening live. Well, so without and, yeah, oh, go ahead, no, go ahead. For I was this. just going to ask. Uh, I mean, w- w- without showing us too much behind the curtain, uh, I mean, do, is it is it you? It, are are you two like two of many writers, or do you guys have others that you sort of corroborate? You know, corroborate with. Uh, we outsource this all to India. Uh, we <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think it's Mirza and myself primarily. Uh, you know, I think uh, well, pretty much Mirza and I are the ones that write everything. Uh, wow. So, yeah, yeah, I think we have a lot of uh, take that for good or bad, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's us, but, you know, within ourselves, there's many personalities. So, <laughs> you know, however you attribute that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know what was interesting, too, another thing worth noting is that, you know, part of this is, you know, us really kind of rediscovering social media from a publishing perspective, too. So I do think, you know, we're learning a little bit of, of the differences of, of broadcasting through Twitter and Facebook and all of that. So, you know, I think for the first time ever, we're kind of comfortable not having everything in one spot. So, you know, a lot of our tweets uh, you would never see because we don't publish those back onto Facebook. We probably do want to do that at some point, but I think we're still figuring that out, whether it's that we're, we've been talking for quite a while about launching. Instagram as well and what would be our take on that. So I think we're going to continue to, to see where we can uh, hopefully resonate and build audience. Well, and, and I'd love for you to talk about that. I mean, in, in terms of the the space, the, the satirical Muslim space, I mean, it's expanded sort of exponentially just in, in the time since you've started. Uh, because I feel like when you guys first showed up, and this is, you alluded to this with, with what you said before, I mean, you were kind of the only game in town. Uh, you know, there, there was you guys doing, doing uh, the, you know, through the newsletter and, and the apparel and whatnot. You know, Azhar Usman was kind of on the front lines as far as uh, Muslim comedians. But now we see there's, you know, I mean, there, there's Maniac Muslim and there's, there's a, you name it. I mean, it's, it's a very richly populated uh, space. And, you know, I say that as a good thing. Uh, what have you learned as far as how best to distinguish yourself? How do you stand out from the crowd? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love it. Uh, go ahead, Mirza. You want to go first? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the content and, and humor has evolved, right? I think we've progressed um, in terms of, you know, the the baseline humor and, and how we've, you know, kind of raised the bar along the way. Um, like you said, like, you, you know, we were the only game in town, but since then there's been many content providers, each kind of bringing um, their own distinct flavor, their own, you know, level of satire, um, as well as just, you know, different angles of how, what kind of content they're, that, that, that they're coming up with. Um, and, you know, we've always uh, looked at ourselves as a very unique brand of uh, humor, brand of comedy, brand of satire. Um, uh, and we still see ourselves as, as fairly unique in, in the way that we cover uh, 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 stories and, and just how we present it, right? Um, in that process, I think... Um, you know, kind of looking at the, the different content providers out there, right? I mean, we have a very stringent process between ourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, our general rule has always been, you know, to if it makes us laugh, then we'll put it out there. Again, you know, I think we've been creatively in this uh, space where we're just trying to entertain people that are like us and hopefully uh, find similar things to laugh at, you know, so much so that I think, you know, Islamica News will go into inside humor and stuff that only Muslims would get, or maybe certain subsections of the Muslim population, or maybe the Chicago area. So I think we're still figuring out a lot of that. But, yeah. you know, I love the fact that the space has evolved so much, you know, I think they all serve as inspiration. And whether it's people writing or up on YouTube or Vines or whatever, you know, I I, I would love them to continue doing what they do because, you know, it's a, it's an artist's movement. And the more of us there are out there, I think the better the quality is and the better it pushes everybody to be better. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I mean, you raise a good point. I mean, I think it's it's interesting because, like, if we were to give a point of comparison, for example, when you look at, like, late night uh, comedy talk shows, right, um, 
you know, 25 years ago, the, the only game in town essentially was Johnny Carson. And so he broadcast to as wide an audience as possible. And arguably that comedy brought people together, but it also uh, left out sort of the niches. And whereas when you contrast that with now where you've got, you know, Jimmy Fallon and, and, and Jimmy Kimmel and, you know, I mean, there's like eight different late night shows. And what that allows for is kind of the quirkiness of like a Conan O'Brien or the, you know, the, the mainstreamness of a Jimmy Fallon, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's an ability to narrow cast uh, today that, that wasn't there uh, certainly, you know, w- when we're talking about late night talk shows, but even when it comes to quote unquote Muslim comedy. Yeah, dude, that's, that's a great point is I think, you know, I think the technology and, and the proliferation of media really allows, uh, you know, us to be liberated as artists, but our audiences to be able to find us in ways that, you know, are unprecedented. So, yeah, you know, I think that, you know, whether uh, wherever we continue to go, you know, I think for a while there we critically thought, you know, are people done reading things online and is, is our articles and long form content still mm. something that we want to be doing or is, does it have to be video? Does it have to shift? And, you know, I think we've stayed true to what we're comfortable doing and what we feel like we're able to do with quality. But uh, to that end, you know, if there's somebody that's vining out there every day or doing whatever. I think those are all great points and audiences to be built. And I don't think it's a, it's an, uh, an or proposition. I think it's an and, you know? Right. And I mean, that's, that's kind of a reflection of, uh, the, the Muslim American experience, right? Um, just, just, it's, it's really reflective of how, um, Muslim Americans have essentially evolved and adapted to, to, to the United States. Right. So first we start out with this low hanging, uh, sort of uh, fruit of, of content of comedy, you know, the, the guy talking in an accent or, you know, whatever that is. But now, you know, content's evolved over time. And I think the bar has been raised, right? So as these mm-hmm. different uh, participants uh, come in, they kind of raise the bar as they kind of introduce themselves. And I think that's very consistent with what you guys are covering um, in Diffuse Congruence, right? Just the overall American story, yeah. uh, American Muslim story, and how we've essentially grown uh, into becoming a part of traditional America. Well, and and to 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 just to piggyback off what you're saying, I mean, I think there's something really telling there in the fact that you know the part of the, not just the the American Muslim experience, but the American experience in general is that communities that are traditionally marginalized use comedy as a way to draw attention to some really important issues. You know, we saw we saw it in the black community with, for example. With um, uh, you know Richard Pryor and and even even Bill Cosby, although that you know obviously he's become kind of a third rail, but um, it, as a way of mainstreaming right. uh, concerns that were unique to that community and sort of saying, well, this is unique to us, but look, you can relate to anyone can relate to this. Yeah, and the Jewish community as well. I mean, right? I mean, oh, absolutely, you, Jackie Mason and Jackie and, Mason, Lenny Bruce, uh, J- Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I, I'm remembering back to one of our first, you know, since our relaunch, one of the big first articles we had that actually made our website go down quicker than <laughs> I would have expected um, was uh, uh, it was I think the title was Muslim Nerds Translate Quran to Klingon. Um, <laughs> And it was it was amazing because I really thought it was one of these that would just go off in a niche and, you know, uh, maybe you'd have a couple of Muslim, you know, Star Trek geeks, present company included, that might actually <laughs> like it. But uh, it spread very quickly into kind of the, the circle and the Google Pluses and uh, some of the, you know, the, the Star Trek. All, community. all those nerdy places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it actually hit, hit two points for me. One, which is to your point, which is that, hey, there are these shared experiences that I think, you know, help establish commonality with what we're doing um and the other piece which is just that um you know you you put it out there and um it kind of you know took a life of its own so um you know people really thought that it was real um and i think some of our more successful articles are the ones that you know people who don't necessarily read the huge footer uh, on our site that's that's all fake (laughs) I really do believe it's real, and we continue to have comments and and uh, people coming in that, that 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 fall prey to that, and that's definitely not our intent. But uh, I don't think we mind additional traffic through confusion. <laughs> well, and and now you, you mentioned how when you first started out, how you know there were some people who didn't who kind of looked down their nose at you. They were like, "You're being disrespectful," etc. Um, do you still get some of that? I don't think as much uh, anymore, right? I think there's been a certain standard that's been set 
Uh, there's been expectation set, right? So just um, with uh, everyone kind of pushing their own content, I think now um, Muslim humor has become uh, more of a household thing. Uh, and so we're not necessarily fighting or, or trying to get over those barriers of, of, um, of essentially, you know, introducing ourselves, presenting our content. It's become yeah, a lot easier. Now we still get into situations where uh, people think um, c- certain things aren't funny just because they might be uh, irreligious or they might be poking fun uh, of the religion. But I think the frequency of that happening is a lot less now than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, yeah, it has to do with just setting that expectation along the way. Yeah, it's a lot less on the religious front, but I think I'll tell you, you know, it's one of those things where I think everybody uh, likes to define satire in their own terms. So I think, you know, we've been fairly uh, uh, equal opportunity with making fun of everyone. Um, but, you know, if you make fun of, uh, I think, Mirza, you know, we, we, we got into some heat a little while back where we uh, saw the women's mosques that were opening up and we wrote uh, an article about mm-hmm. uh uh, an entire mosque being essentially the sisters section uh, of the mosque um, and just kind of, you know, thought what we thought was kind of funny stuff, but uh, definitely hit a raw nerve with uh, some of the more vocal sort of women's rights sorts of uh, uh, Muslim sub communities. Um, likewise, you know, I think we just tweeted out at the beginning of Ramadan, uh, an article about uh, fat Muslims dreading the coming of Ramadan. Yeah, um, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, again, you're going to have those moments where you just, you know, offend people. People. And, you know, it's funny, I'm a fat person and I wrote it, um, but <laughs> some people just don't have that sort of sense of self-humor. Uh, and I, I don't think we, we we set out to offend people, but I think, you know, at some point uh, people end up with their sensitivities being in the crosshair uh, of, of satire. And uh, it's just part of the game. I and beyond it's- that, just for the record, I mean, Islamic and News, although a lot of the content is satirical, a lot of it's just sophomore, sophomore humor, right? That's not really satire at all, right? So we, I think there was this one article that we wrote, uh, handsome imam will give 50 shades of gray area sermon this Friday, right? Um, I, I don't think there, anything about that article was necessarily, uh, trying to punch upward at all. It was just <laughs> funny that we decided to roll with. And so there, there, there really is no value or no point that we're trying, no agenda that we're trying to push with some of our content. And then we get kind of trapped in this, well, this isn't satire. And so we get in that conversation and the reality is, is just, you know, some of it's just pure entertainment. Yeah. And that, that article, actually, we had some people reaching out to us trying to get that imam to their local mosque. <laughs> which <is funny. laughs> Well, and I mean, how do you decide like at, at, at you know, do, do you, What's your barometer for deciding, well, this might be offensive? Like, do you, do you, is it kind of like anything goes in service of a joke or do you keep in mind, like, well, we don't want to piss people off? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know if we've nailed it. Um, you know, I remember Mirza and I, we had, we, we've had a lot of, uh, uh, uh you know, uh, collaboration as well as some disagreements. I remember one of the articles that I thought was pushing it a while back uh, that, that Mirza wrote, which again, you know, resonated fairly well, uh, was about Eid uh, Salat being held at a, at a strip club called Bambi's in Dallas, uh, because I guess all the convention halls were sold out in this imaginary universe. Um, and it was one of those where, you know, I, I think we pushed it out there and uh, it, it didn't go over as badly as I thought it would have. It actually was, was one of the more popular articles that was out there at the time. So so, uh, I, you know, it, it, I don't know. I think cultural values and I think religious values are so transient sometimes and so relative mm-hmm. um, that I don't know if there's anything that, you know, I think some of the ones that were the most tame uh, sometimes maybe offended people incredibly. So um, I think we just kind of shoot by, play, you know, play it by ear, shoot from the hip, call it what you want. But uh, we've had the good fortune of not screwing up too badly uh, to this point. I don't know, Mirza, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really kind of a trial and error process as well. Some of it is test content, but we will, what I will say is that it's 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 interesting to see the kind of people or the different types of uh, personalities that content you know will ultimately find, right? So um, you know, what resonates well with a certain audience uh, with one article may not resonate you know with another group of, of people. And then likewise, you know, an, another uh, article that we publish will find a completely different audience, right? So it's funny to see, you know, how the, con- the, the content finds its audience and ultimately the feedback that we get. Um, you know, that Klingon article, I found a very geeky audience. 
uh, the sports articles find, you know, the, 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 the sports savvy audience. And so, you know, part of the exercise is, is just to kind of push it out there and, and see what, what sticks. Yeah, it's interesting, too. I think most recently we've we've had the misfortune of having our advertising accounts banned uh, and and uh, unapproved through some social media providers. Twitter oh, for wow. pulled the plug on us uh, because we fall under the sensitive content policy, which oh. is great for Twitter because they can arbitrarily define whatever they want to be sensitive. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, but, you know, fortunately, it doesn't affect our organic sort of Twitter. But any any time we want to promote a tweet now, we basically can't do it. And it's funny because, you know, at the end of the day, the, one of the pieces that they cited as the reason for us being banned uh, was an article we wrote about Zayn Malik. You know, when he quit One Direction, uh, we had an article about Zayn Malik essentially quitting One Direction to join ISIS, uh, which we thought was just kind of a, another absurdity uh, that most people would see. OK, well, yeah, you're not going to have go from a multimillionaire uh you know, to, to joining ISIS. Uh, right. But apparently people have been complaining about it. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just amazing to me that like that really, that that's the one you're going to pick, you know, <laughs> not, wow. not, not the other hundreds of things that you could have chosen. <laughs> although, I, although from what I, what, from what I've seen and heard, uh, from, uh, one direction fans, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of that backlash was <laughs> from actually from, from, uh, you know, 13 year old girl. Yeah. That, that people is crazy. That. Yeah, we shouldn't have called them pimply faced, probably. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think that came more from those circles than Muslim ones, but uh, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, well, and and uh, real briefly, I'd love for you to talk about uh, your apparel. You've mentioned that you're thinking about bringing that back, and and I mean, what what are your plans uh, as far as that goes? Yeah, the apparel. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, side of the business is is something that we're uh, it's in the works right now. I think we uh, have a lot of ideas. We, we've got a huge inventory of shirts, by the way. Our collective basements are full of boxes and boxes of leftover inventory. So, first of all, we got to liquidate that. Uh, secondly, we've got sale, <laughs> sale, sale. <laughs> and yeah, this is a shameless plug as well. So if if, if you need shirts, come by uh, Chicago, come by come by our houses, and and we'll we'll kind of deal. Um, but, uh, we've, you know, we've got to look at the market now in terms of, you know, what people are wearing, you know, what, what the youth are wearing and, and really see, um, you know, how t-shirts in general are, are used, right? Are they still, um, you know, primary points of expression? Are people still wearing them the same way? Uh, what can we, um, use in terms of, um, uh, expression and, and incorporate into our shirts, um, you know, what kind of design from, you know, creative aspect do we need to come up with? Is it still the same style that we introduced 10, 15 years ago? Since people are always trying to make a fashion statement, do we want to revisit that? So those are the kind of conversations that we're having behind the scenes. But really, um, we, we are, uh, in, you know, pretty hyped and we're pretty excited about bringing back T-shirts just because, you know, it is a great – uh, uh, a great side of the business, and it, it's been a great, enjoyable operation. And Afif Majid, who is not part of this conversation today, is has been instrumental in that aspect of the business. And so, uh, you know, kind of working together, we're we're kind of trying to figure out: do we want to push this uh, uh, on the site? Do we want to other, you know, revisit other distribution channels? Is it more of a on-demand sort of structure? All the all those stuff, all those pieces are, are kind of being discussed right now. Yeah, and, you know, from the apparel side, I think what was interesting for us is, you know, we were fairly scrupulous about, like, uh, I should say meticulous, uh, about making sure that, you know, not only was it uh, a design that we felt proud of, but that it was manufactured in a way that was supportive uh, of, of uh, you know, U.S. businesses and um, manufactured to the quality that we would have expected. And, you know, you, you're not going to be complaining after five washes that the ink has come off. So I think those are the things that fortunately have become a lot easier and and, uh, you know, better for us to be able to take care of now so we can tick those boxes. But I think, you know, the challenge for us now is, you know, how do we reintroduce a product that, you know, at the time, you know, we were charging $25 for a T-shirt, which is not cheap. Uh, and we, we heard from a lot of people, you know, hey, well, you know, that next booth at the Isma Convention is selling a $5 T-shirt. Why isn't your T-shirt $5? And, you know, we, we were always pretty comfortable with not competing with that, you know, not not to sound um, hoity-toity, but, you know, it, that that wasn't the product we competed with. It was about, you know, the quality, the craftsmanship, and the, the attention to detail and people willing to pay for that. So the, the challenge for us now is obviously T-shirts 
t-shirts, you know, alone have become a whole nother sort of a market and you've got all of these on demand things and craziness. So we're just trying to, again, figure out what is the quality of the product that we can put out? What is the premium that we can put around it? And then ultimately, how does that ladder back up to our creative vision? So I think we're excited at the possibilities there. I think we've got quite a bit left to explore, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see some of your old classics uh, that may have uh, fallen apart by now uh, back up for sale in the very near future. And I'm for Viz and Zucky. I don't know if you bought any of our shirts or have any of our shirts, but if you have an opportunity and you can pull them out of your respective wardrobes, you will see that the quality is still there, right? We, we, we had a quality product, so I'm sure it's uh, still like the way it looked when you bought it. So there's a shameless plug about just the <laughs> no, I, 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 I think that says a lot, and I, I think there, 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 you know, we, you know, we've talked a lot about like how the market has evolved, how the Muslim community has evolved, and so I think certainly you'll find, you know, a very willing and receptive uh, consumer market out there in terms of people who look for that kind of quality and are willing to pay, you know, a, a premium, if you will. Uh, for a quality T-shirt that's not made in some sweatshop and isn't going to fall shop, you know, fall apart after two washes or what have you, um, you know. But I, I will say, for Viz, I mean, we diversified back then as well, and so we introduced something called uh, yoga pants or um, very loose yoga pants for for ladies. And man, did we get yelled at for that? I mean, we so that has been part of the process too. Is that outside of T-shirts, how do we want to diversify? Do we want to really focus on a Muslim female market as well? Um, how do we go about doing that without, you know, with, with at the same time being receptive to some of the sensitivities? And so there's a lot of learning lessons that we built up along the way. But I'm sure, you know, as we go down this path again, we're probably going to get yelled at for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one one quick thing while we're on the the topic of T-shirts and conventions, I think we could do a whole another podcast on just the selling experience at a Muslim convention. Uh, <laughs> with the product we had, but, um, it was interesting, you know, you do see these people coming up to the booth and, you know, you, you, you feel bad cause you want to provide a product at every price point that people would want to be able to buy. And, and, you know, uh, anyway, I, I, there, there were more than one occasion where you would see some, somebody, maybe an older auntie or something coming up to the booth and, uh, and complaining about the price, uh, that, Hey, this is, this is $25, you know? Um, and then, you know, you kind of explain your rationale and then, you know, they're still upset at you, but they'll buy three shirts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there's something to be said about, you know, again, um, maybe I, I don't want to call it education, but I do think it's about continuing to kind of uh, push values that I think sometimes, especially as part of the immigrant experience, you kind of put aside and maybe you right. on the price point. Uh, and I think, you know, once people understand that, I think as a brand, we kind of created this this uh, this feel uh, of what of what our values were that obviously were shared values with our with our consumers. So, uh, you know, again, that's that's very much the authenticity with which we would reapproach uh, apparel. You know, I, I've been wanting to ask, like, as, as as guys who've sort of, you know, n you know, comment on the state of the Muslim community, how, where, where we are, where we've gone, uh, and as someone, you know, who runs a business, as people, you know, as as guys who run a business and have sort of looked at the market and analyzed the market, are, are these like? Are these big ISNA conventions slash what have you, RIS or whatever else is out there, are they still a thing? I mean, as someone who hasn't gone to a convention in like 10 years now, um, you know, how has that changed? How has that scene changed? I know it's sort of taking our conversation slightly away from, from what we were talking about, but I'd love for you to co sort of comment on that, both as, both as sort of cultural observers as well as, you know, market, as someone who's done the market research. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I've got some thoughts on that. And, you know, I, I think we ourselves are fairly disconnected from uh, the, the conference scene as well, having not actively yeah. participated in them, meaning having a booth there, having some sort of presence there for the past, you know, few years. But at the same time, I think because of social media um, and that constant engagement uh, between uh, people who would have traditionally participated in a conference type of environment, I think somewhat, you know, the, the conference has has become somewhat irrelevant um, in that, you know, the whole um, excitement and the buzz around, you know, seeing people from, you know, uh, across the country or across the world, potentially, that has kind of gone away, right? Just because, you know, we're constantly talking about relevant topics um, that, you know, that happen to, to be mainstream America. Uh, so I think there has been a little bit of shift in participation from uh, the conference scene to, you know, taking that conference whole interaction to the online social media scene. Uh, 
that's been our personal observation. Um, but, you know, outside of that, you know, I think there is some, you know, there's, there is value, I think, engagement in, in, of engagement in, in a conference sort of setting. And we're planning to revisit um, ISNA this year in some capacity. And I think we'll have a better handle on it uh, past uh, September of this year. Yeah, we'll let you know if we get laughed out of the building <laughs> in a good way. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, it, I, I totally agree with what Mirza said. You know, I think I personally haven't been able to visit uh, for the last several years as well, but I do think technology has made us all come closer. I will say one of my biggest uh, frustrations with the ISMA scene uh, from probably 10 years ago now at this point, it was was the lack of focus on uh, the arts and kind of entertainment piece. It always felt like it was kind of bolted on and not really something that was treated with value. And I do think they've come a long way in terms of trying to promote that more, although uh, yeah be interesting to see how that that part in particular is represented well i mean yeah i I agree in terms of what you just said um you know and it was fascinating to me even in those years that i did attend you know like like issues that were real uh contentious issues uh you know, maybe five, six years at the early part of my, you know, tenure and going to those type of conventions like the permissibility of music or having musical instruments be a part of be a part of the uh, of the entertainment scene. And then you just sort of see that, you know, disappear. And then the next thing you know, you know, you have guitars and drums, uh, you know, it's not it's not entertainment. So uh, it, it's it's really been interesting to sort of lo- uh, to, to look at how those issues have also evolved, whether it's not only in terms of like content. But also, like I remember as audience participants, you know, the way even seating arrangements have changed at at these conventions where, you know, uh, it was very, very segregated and now not so much at all. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally agreed. I think it'll be interesting to kind of get back into those waters and kind of see kind of see how the audience needs have changed. You know, I, I think, um, you know, we, we might take a little bit of a risk here with some of our product being there, but I think we've always been pretty good about selling. I think we'll find a place for people that are interested in what we're doing. And I'm hoping that the convention will be another place that is still of, of relevance. Well, there we go. And I think, I think that's a good place to sort of, uh, wind things down with this conversation. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've been very happy to see Islamica back in a big way, and I, I certainly hope uh, to hear even more uh, expansive uh, uh, plans for, for what you have going on next. Um, as far as uh, how, where people can find you, I mean, I know that you've, you alluded to several different ways people can reach out to you. Uh, where are you online? Uh, yeah, you can find us on the web at uh, islamicanews.com, uh, I-S-L-A-M-I-C-A. Uh, we're also on Twitter at, at Islamica News. And uh, I think uh, Facebook is at uh, facebook.com slash Islamica News. We're on Google Plus as well. Uh, Google doesn't make the URLs easy, but uh, you can find us there as well. Um, and I think those are pretty much the areas where we're publishing regularly. And uh, Facebook is probably the best place to kind of keep in the loop on what's happening with the latest and greatest. And uh, do, do you guys have, have Twitter accounts if, if people want to follow you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll say mine. Uh, mine is uh, at Azhar Ahmed, uh, A-Z-H-E-R-A-H-M-E-D. Uh, and uh, I apologize in advance for my tweets. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm at Nurza Big. And that's M I R Z A B A I G. That is correct. Awesome. Well, uh, with that, uh, we're, that wraps up another conversation for for this show. But but like I said, I, I fully expect that that we'll we'll be touching base with you again soon because it sounds like you've got a lot of fun stuff going on. Yeah, we thank you guys for the time. It's been great, and uh, we look forward to hopefully uh, having more stuff to talk about in the near future. No, that'll be great. And uh, Pervez, as as we sign off, where can people find you online? So I am at uh, the new Madhub, that is M-A-D-H-H-A-B. Uh, on Twitter, you can hit our uh, hit us up on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. And our email address, which is diffuse congruence at gmail.com. Please uh, tell us your thoughts. Uh, give us any feedback. Do write us a review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. All of your feedback is much appreciated and is helpful. How about yourself, Zaki? Very true. 
Well, I, I'm I'm on Twitter at Zeki's Corner. That's the AKIS Corner, and I'm also at the Huffington Post, where my movie reviews go up regularly, as do uh, my various podcasts. You can also find me online at Zeki's Corner dot com. That's the AKIS Corner dot com. And with that, that brings uh, the curtain down on another episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next month. Thank you.